Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Okay, so today we have uh, Vadim Klushnikov uh, visiting the Quark group. Uh, he's a candidate uh, for our group. Vadim actually spent this last summer working with us, so many of us know him very well. His research interests uh, mainly focus around quantum compiling, uh, quantum circuit synthesis, looking at exact and approximate synthesis of single and multi-qubit gates into different uh, bases of gates, and that's what he's going to talk about today. Uh, he's getting his uh, PhD with uh, Michele Mosca at uh, the Institute for Quantum Computing at the University of Waterloo in Canada, and he'll be finishing up in the spring, um, probably March. Uh, so today, Vadim's going to talk to us about his number theoretic methods, uh, number theoretic methods in quantum compiling, uh, and work he's done on a variety of different bases uh, for single qubit circuit decomposition. So. The team. Yeah, thank you for the introduction. Um, yeah. So yeah, <clears throat> first I start actually with uh, just some broad statement of the problem. So uh, what is uh, compiling for quantum computers and why actually do we need it? Uh, so on one side we have a quantum algorithm uh, that we that promise us to uh, solve certain problems much more efficient than in a classical computer and. Uh, examples of this is a billion hidden subgroup problem or chemistry simulation or very famous factoring, right? And uh, on the other hand, uh, we have a quantum hardware. So this is uh, actually uh, where we're going to execute our algorithm. And uh, it turns out that uh, this you know, path, it's not that short from going from high level description of quantum algorithm. Uh, to a quantum hardware. And if one day somebody comes and asks, okay, I build this uh, some early model of quantum computer, I have this many qubits and it uh, can execute this long uh, sequences, so can I do something interesting on it? And basically it turns out that this, to answer this question, to help experimentalists to execute uh, to, to use his actually computer for something interesting, uh, a lot of work uh, needs to be done. And I'm going to uh, talk about some problems uh, appearing in uh, this direction today. And here is also just an uh, example of uh, that actually this moment can be uh, not that far of the future. This is a slide from David DiVincenzo talk on QIP 2013, uh, basically showing that there is a, uh, some kind of Moore law um, for coherence time of superconducting qubits. And uh, basically shows that uh, it's the, advan the advances over the last years is uh, pretty impressive. Right. <clears throat> so I start with an, uh, some examples of architectures of quantum computers. Uh, so we always start with a uh, physical system uh, that is uh, uh, somehow controlled. Right? And uh, after control level, uh, there are several possibilities depending on uh, what uh, physical system we have. So the most uh, kind of conventional situation is uh, after uh, quantum control, we, give, uh, we get a physical layer gate set. And we use this gate set to execute some fault tolerant protocol uh, to uh, improve the quality of the gate set so it uh, can handle precision uh, required for the algorithm. And uh, the most common example of fault tolerant gate set is uh, Clifford plus T. I'll explain uh, what it is on the next slide. And uh, after that, uh, we basically execute circuits in this gate set. And uh, the quantum algorithms must be decomposed into the circuits uh, precisely in this gate set. So this is what actually uh, makes this path not trivial, right? Because start with quantum algorithm and we, and we need to go like through many layers to actually uh, to, to control in some physical system. Uh, the other uh, two architectures is uh, related to topological quantum computers. So this architecture related to Eisen anion model. Uh, so here we get uh, some physically protected gates, uh, Clifford group, which is 
uh, not enough to get a universal computation. That, uh, that's why we need uh, some extra procedures to get a T gate, uh, to get universality, and this is done through state distillation. Uh, and the third uh, picture shows um, architecture where all ga where the gate set available uh, is actually universal and topologically protected, and this corresponds to Fibonacci anions model. And uh, I'll I'll talk today about uh, uh, this gate set, uh, gate set in Fibonacci anion model and Clifford NT. Uh, so more now just some example, right? So the uh, very common building block of many quantum algorithms is quantum Fourier transform, and it uses R0 rotations, uh, which is this uh, diagonal unitary matrices, right? And uh, here is example, here is a specific uh, matrices of Clifford and T gates as on single qubit. You see this is a T gate, uh, which has uh, A's root of unity in it, and uh, Hadamard gate, and uh, I also include other Clifford gates like phase gate and poly gates, uh, ZX um, into gate set. Uh, for uh, Fibonacci model, uh, single qubit uh, gate set uh, uh, looks like uh, up to global phase, it's 10th uh, root of unity to the seventh power, and uh, uh, this is the one generator of a gate set, and the other generator uh, is uh, the first one conjugated by F matrix. Uh, which uh, is made of uh, inverse of gold golden ratio and uh, its square roots. So, uh, and I'm in my talk today. I'm actually going to uh, focus on this problem. So, how you take uh, single qubit R0 rotations and uh, decompose this into these gate sets. And uh, what's important to mention is that this can, like, nearly always, this cannot be done exactly. Therefore, you need to approximate. Right? And the main parameter of interest is the precision of approximation and the efficiency of how you efficiently solve the problem is actually uh, how many gates you need to approximate uh, this rotation depending on the precision you require. Okay, so now I uh, uh, give some brief overview of what was known before on this problem. Uh, uh, it's, uh, of course, so, uh, this problem, uh, you know, was the question was asked in the beginning of, uh, like, nearly in the beginning of research in quantum computing, and uh, uh, first kind of uh, really satisfactory answer was the Solovey type theorem and corresponding algorithm. Uh, so the uh, this uh, algorithm itself and appeared like in uh, by Kitai. So the, there was like. Actually, it was discovered in parallel by Soloway and Kitaev in 1995 and uh, 1997. And uh, 2005 points out to Dawson's paper, which makes it kind of, it's kind of a review with, uh, which is more easy to actually program on a computer because uh, that work is you know, more theoretical uh, and not that straightforward to implement. Uh, so, and uh, this question basically solved uh, at least some high-level problem saying that, okay, if you have some gate set, we can do this efficiently. So uh, this logarithm sh says that uh, because we, we won't like, lose any speed-ups. If you even have a polynomial speed-up in our uh, quantum algorithm, like Grover search or some other examples, right, we still uh, will have this speed-up because this is just logarithmic overhead, right? And uh, of course, there was like uh, always was a solution like brute force solution. Uh, here I point out just to papers that first time actually did it uh, for Clifford and T gate set. Uh, it's uh, Austin Fowler. Uh, so, and you see that number of gates uh, you can uh, kind of do with brute force it scales like log one of epsilon. While in Slovakia type it's like log 3.97. So conceptually, you know, when you talk about complexity of algorithms, it's not a big deal, but once you uh, really helping your ex experimentalist to do something interesting. It's, it, it becomes a big deal because uh, this uh, gives like big constant factors uh, or just big, big uh, factors of overhead. Uh, so th there was some other works uh, related to this, uh, which actually has uh, pretty interesting scaling but has their drawbacks. For example, uh, phase kickback uh, described in uh, Kitaev's book. 
uh, it um, uh, uses like adder as a building block and um, kind of uh, has uh, uh, gives you log one over epsilon approximation, but it's used uh, some number of ancillas that will uh, scale over time and um, uh, will scale like depending on the precision. Uh, so there is like programmable ancilla rotations by Cody Jones uh, that um, also includes some a lot of uh, kind of kind of hierarchical construction with measurements. Um, so it heavily depends as a last one on resource states. And actually, you know, if complexity hides into resource states, this is not trivial to implement. And there's also a work uh, by Chris Swar and uh, Douglas uh, uh, Cianci uh, on uh, some kind of very interesting approach how you make a, a ladder of uh, state, uh, ladders with measurements and feedback uh, to, g to get uh, something like 1.12 or a little bit more, right? And uh, so, but still, I uh, think, uh, you know, like classical solution is the Lake type algorithm and uh, it's, uh, you know, interesting thing about it is, you know, it doesn't require measurements and uh, achieves um, uh, this without any kind of resource state, so. Uh, the classical runtime in case of the phase kickback method and the PAR, is that for the uh, preparation of the resource state? Because once so, you no, have that, uh, there's no compilation really. To yeah, so that. actually, I mean, it's uh, why I'm saying like log one over epsilon. This is, I mean, there's the always runtime classical just to write down a circuit, right? So it cannot, I mean, if you need to write down a circuit, right, you will have uh, at least uh, this. So at least number of gates in the circuit, right? And uh, for par, actually, this is uh, some kind of, um, you know, ladder of uh, this classical feedback. So those are like some expectation. So this expectation is does not include resource state, right? So and on average, you, you can kind of finish this ladder in constant number of steps. But of course, to kind of do compilation and some classical processing and run this, uh, you know, classical feedback and take into account which actual states you need, uh, you will still have classic, need classical runtime. I That's think right. you can do it with one. The elements are really just errors yeah. in that case. Right? Uh, yeah. Uh, with uh, face kickback, it's yeah. errors. With uh, par, it's slightly different thing. Right. Um, yeah. Okay. Well, and I think what is actually interesting about this problem, there's like some uh, other side of this problem, which uh, was uh, has also interesting interest, uh, interesting history. Uh, so we can ask a question: Okay, uh, is there like how many of these universal gate sets uh, that will actually saturate this bound? So we we saw like we've seen like from brute force that Clifford and T can do it, right? But there is actually no proof that uh, there was no proof that uh, you know Clifford and T saturate lower bound. Right, and uh, in 1986 and 1987, uh, there was paper by Lubosky, Philip, and Cernak actually s showing that there is a gate set, just example of gate set, which uh, saturates this uh, lower bound. Right, uh, later there was a paper by Aram, Harrow, Recht, and Chan uh, generalizing uh, this result on uh, SUD, basically. So S U two corresponds to one qubit, right? And S U D uh, can correspond to either qubits, either to several qubits, right? And uh, just you know, very recently uh, there was two results um, uh, by mathematicians actually uh, saying that uh, if you have all, any universal gate set uh, with uh, unitaries that has entries as algebraic numbers, you can you will always saturate this lower bound. And this is not not non-trivial result. Uh, so the for SU2 it was in 2008. For SUD it was uh, in 2011. And uh, the first author actually is a field medalist. Uh, so and uh, for example, second paper is like around like 60 pages proof. Um, right. So um, uh, this kind of shows that I mean actually questions uh, that I'm uh, answering are. Not trivial because uh, even like existential like results about existence are difficult, and I'm talking here about constructive uh, constructive proofs for some interesting special cases uh, of this problem. So and this is just you know some uh, kind of 
uh, additional motivation to see, okay, how it works, right? So these are results for Fibonacci anions, right? This is, uh, for example, this is uh, what we need to achieve precision 10 to minus 10 with solvay type algorithm, and uh, this is for number theoretic method. So like 160 or over like 4,000. And if you go like up to higher precisions, like 10 to minus 30, which is also pretty conceivable with what might be required for quantum algorithm, uh, it's uh, 458 gates versus like 5 to 10 to the 5. So this is why I'm saying that uh, once you actually experimentalists come to you and ask for help, then using methods like Slovakia type is uh, not, the, uh, not the way to go. You actually need something much better. Okay, <clears throat> so now I'm, uh, yeah, maybe one comment I want to make. Uh, also, as I'm talking about Fibonacci anions, so this is actually the other thing. Uh, you see uh, here is, uh, I mentioned this is all for Clifford and T, right? And it turns out actually the phase kickback is based on the adder, right? Which is easy to do in case of uh, Clifford and T gate set, but totally not easy to do in Fibonacci case. Actually, uh, <clears throat> basically to do an adder, to be able to do an adder, you need the methods like this. So. Uh, I think, like for Fibonacci case, actually number theoretic methods are kind of much more important and much more special because to go like to be able to do most of these methods, you actually need to do them first. Uh, need to do to get, uh, 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 for example, C naught, right, and Toffoli gate, and to to get this gate, you in Fibonacci model you, you need uh, number theoretic approximations. Okay. So with this, now I'm, uh, first I will uh, talk about how this works for Clifford and T gate set. Uh, it's a kind of older result and a little bit more, uh, you know, uh, there, there's more things known and you, you can be uh, here like really, really, really precise. Uh, so this is how it's done before, right? So you start with some unitary and as a result of your approximation, you get circuit, for example, from solvay type algorithm. And the other way how it's done with number theoretic methods, uh, you take a unitary, uh, you do a round, unitary round off, and you come up with exact unitary, which is uh, close to your original unitary. And exact, by exact unitary, I mean the unitary that can be done exactly uh, with the gate set of your choice. In this case, Clifford and T. Later, it will, will be gate set for Fibonacci anions. And then you apply exact synthesis algorithm to get a Clifford plus T circuit or um, circuit for the other gate set. And um, <clears throat> so what's important here, uh, right, is actually uh, not just to uh, be able to do this round off procedure and exact synthesis. You also want to control the uh, kind of quality of your approximation. And uh, uh, because uh, as we've seen from this bound, right? So the more you gates, so the better quality you want, more gates you need, right? And there is a question how you take this into account this, right? So actually, uh, the other important part of this exact synthesis story is that you, you're able to say, okay, so uh, how this unitary must look like if uh, you want more gaze and how it must look like if you m want less gaze and you make this choice during round of procedure. So during round of procedure, you can actually make a choice how much freedom you, you get, right? So this corresponds how long circuit you will end in the end. In, and based on this, you, you get a uh, better uh, round of or uh, slightly worse depending on the choice. So, let me, so, so, so your error tolerance is set in that first Step, yeah, in some it's, sense, it's right? step step, uh, but step you, here. But you need to be able to somehow propagate it into the synthesized yeah. circuit at the right. Yeah. Um, so, uh, so this how this happens, right? So, uh, basically, there's um, you know, uh, you say, okay, I have uh, circuits of a certain length, right? And this says that uh, this exact unitary must have a certain form, right? Once you have this certain form, that uh, can, so this form kind of fix the length of the circuit, so you, you won't get more than something, right? And once you fix this length, you get some freedom, right? And the more length, uh, kind of more, more length the circuit you get, more freedom you propagate on this step. And more freedom you have, you get uh, better approximations. So this is how it works. 
Well, and uh, yeah, for this, was for this particular case, uh, in this actual case, the uh, story about uh, how the exact, synthesis, exact unitaries looks like is pretty simple, uh, right? So uh, all unitaries uh, that can be done exactly with single qubit must have entries of this form, right? So it's um, <coughs> sum of uh, different powers of a root of unity with integer coefficients divided by power of square root of two. And so if each entry of your single qubit unitary looks like this, then you can come up with a circuit. And I, I will show in a few slides, actually, the intuition how this power here is related uh, to the complexity of the circuit. This is what I'm going to talk. Um, yeah, here's a reminder how the gate set, uh, gate set looks like, right? So you see that uh, in this case, uh, entries are of the desired form, right? So you have this power of square root of two once, and this is ace root of unity, so uh, they have desired form. Uh, this uh, set, it's a ring, so it's closed under addition and multiplication. So when we multiply these matrices together, we get, again, unity from the same ring. And uh, this uh, uh, gives uh, this uh, theorem that I announced already. Uh, so single qubit unitary can be implemented exactly if and only if uh, its entries has this form. Right? And the other part of the uh, theorem is interesting. There is efficient algorithm how to actually get a circuit out of it. And it's both efficient and it also guarantees optimality in the number of Hadamard and T gates. Right? So the only gates that you kind of um, have freedom is uh, some, some small amount of polys. So all other things are optimal except like we don't make statements about optimality of polygates, which are like really, really cheap in uh, fault tolerance setting. Okay, here is some example just to show intuition behind how this uh, power of the denominator uh, related to the uh, circuit size. So I take uh, just HT to the N, which is, uh, has infinite order, right? And I raise it to different powers. And I see, I look actually instead of entries, I look at absolute value square, square of entries. And we see that after each step, basically, kind of if you pull out uh, this um, denominator, uh, power increases by one, right? And um, so this motivates uh, the definition was called like smaller denominator exponent, uh, which is the smallest exponent you can get here. Because why, why is this like word is smallest here, right? Because there is some kind of freedom. You can multiply this, for example, by square root two and this square root two by square root two and write five. And so the basically smallest means that we minimize this by keeping these things still integers uh, or integer, like well, keeping them of this form, right? With integer coefficients, right? And now I'm going to make precise uh, the intuition. Uh, so uh, this is uh, uh, basically main kind of uh, uh, main important result, right? So uh, we want to know if you want to simplify circuit, right, we kind of want to uh, chop some, like, its complexity uh, by small steps, right? And for this, we use uh, generators of the form HT to the K, right? So we kind of use them to uh, reduce, uh, uh, kind of unwind the whole, the circuit for the unitary, right? And uh, uh, the important question, what uh, happens to this denominator when we do this, right? And uh, this statement basically shows uh, that by adjusting k here, right, we can uh, adjust uh, this power of denominator. Either it increases by one, either it decreases by one, either leave it the same. Right? And this is kind of a uh, basic thing for efficiency of our algorithm. So we can always, this means we can always decrease this SD, right? And basically we can greedily uh, reduce SD for the circuit uh, and uh, uh, Kind of get some very simple unitary in the end, right? Uh, so this is more precise statement of the algorithm. Right? So on each we take input unitary, we uh, calculate smaller de smallest denominator exponent, then we calculate new unitary uh, with different powers of k here, right? And um, p k such a way that we can represent it in this form. So you see n minus one is crucial here. We have n and we can always reduce it by one, right? And then we replace our kind of reminder unitary uh, 
uh, with this uh, new one. And also you kind of keep in memory what, the k, what, what k we use for the choice to reconstruct the circuit. And we can do this up to like, um, so um, I will discuss later, there was some progress on this part. Uh, this is the earliest way. Uh, so the, the f in the first version it just was, you can reduce it below four. And for below four, this is a very small amount of different unitaries uh, that you can look up uh, in your database. Right. Uh, here are some ideas uh, why it's actually H optimal and why, uh, why it's uh, T optimal. So I start with H optimality, and it turns out that one can show that to increase or decrease the small denominator exponent by one, you need precisely one IH gate. Right? And then you check that uh, the set of unitaries with small denominator exponent four is the same as the set of unitaries with, uh, that needs to be, needs, uh, uh, three Hadamard gates, right? And basically, this is uh, then shown using the results that I've, I've shown you before. So this is a crucial step to show um, H optimality, right? And for T optimality, it actually follows from H optimality. Uh, and it turns out if you have uh, circuits of this form, ones like have IH in the end and the beginning, uh, then this circuit must be also a T optimal. Right, and uh, this is the first step, and the, on the second step, you actually kind of, um, stack this outside two things, right, and pick k j in, su in such a way, uh, and of then uh, uh, number of, uh, so basically make sure that number of Hadamars is optimal by, uh, for this circuit by picking k and j, and then you can understand what was kind of uh, on the ends. Right, and out of this, you get a precise expression for calculating a number of T gates uh, for the unit, uh, uh, for the given unit. So, and it's actually, I mean, it's kind of very precise, uh, very efficient expression, right? Because you don't need to know much, you just need to know this uh, one over square root two, right? And uh, some residues um, uh, of the entries. Uh -huh. So when, uh, s since, since you reduce uh, the circuit using h t to the power k, right? Yes. Uh, so so uh, do you count in the, uh, the occurrences of the phase gate? So t, t to the power k could have so a it turns out, or zero. Uh, yeah, it turns out that you can um, there are just, uh, so not all, um, so first um, as you get like, uh, H optimal circuit, you cannot have H P H phase gate H because this is not H optimal, because right. you can do the same circuit with right. one Hadamard gate. Um, then it's uh, kind of eliminates some possibilities, and you get just two possibilities with uh, T gate, uh, and one of them is just T gate, and the other one can be expressed as uh, T dagger multiplied by poly Z, poly Z matrix. Right, so you actually, you don't need phase gate in these steps. You just need poly Z. That's why I said that I don't, and I count, uh, yeah, I count the T dagger the same cost as the T gate, which is uh, motivated by fault tolerance and partial, right? Because in fault tolerance, it's absolutely the same cost to do like uh, T and T dagger. Okay, yeah, but thanks. Uh, yeah. So and this is just some kind of, a little bit more details on uh, how this proved, right? And uh, so there are actually like one analytic part of the proof to show this inequality. So this this is done just through like tedious series of exercises about the properties of this uh, smaller denominator e uh, exponent. So you try to understand how it behaves on the addition and multiplication. And the second part is actually when you need to show that you can always pick the k uh, such that it can be increased and reduced by one, right? And this is uh, the computer assisted part that just need to check some finite number of cases. Um, and here is kind of just one idea is crucial, right? Uh, so once you have numbers like this, right? You don't need to know the whole number to understand if the SD can be reduced or not. You just need to do, need to know basically three last bits. And Computer assist parts just take different combination of last bits and checks uh, exhaustively for these different combinations that this can be done. Uh, so, yeah. 
Uh, this, this is how, yeah, I'll discuss later that there are some kind of maybe easier way uh, to look at this, but um, I think uh, there are still benefits of uh, this way because you will see that uh, there are some kind of similarities and differences for Fibonacci case, uh, which still look uh, in some in some sense similar, um, right? Uh, so and actually, exact synthesis algorithm give you like a tool. Uh, to efficiently <coughs> approximate uh, circuits, and it, it, it can be used in different ways. And here I want to highlight um, just one of these, uh, one of ways, and this is um, kind of some smart search method, right? So this is actually about uh, if you want to really guarantee the quality. So how you find optimal uh, circuits, so it's it's not like it's not done in polynomial time, but you can do it to the precisions like 10 to minus 15, 10 to minus 17, which is uh, uh, maybe which is quite sufficient for many applications, uh, and uh, especially for early ones. And then I will also like later mention why it can actually can be like sufficient for for anything at all, right? Uh, so my aim to approximate this R0 rotation, right, and I'm approximated with uh, unitaries like this, well, all entries is from the ring that I've, I've been talking about. Uh, the distances I'm interested in is a tracing, uh, global phase invariant uh, trace distance, um, right, and it can be simplified to expression like this. And important uh, point here is that this expression is depends only on the one entry of the unitary, right, and uh, this, uh, uh, gives enough you know, uh, way. Uh, kind of, this dictates the way so how approximation works. I just first I uh, pick x uh, in such a way that I achieve certain approximation, and then I reconstruct the full unitary. And to re reconstruct the full unitary, uh, the equation like this must be solved. And uh, the main kind of challenge of this method is that this equation does not always have a solution, and the so finding solution to this equation is also a challenge. Um, so this is just uh, actually just kind of plot. This is a complex plane, right? And these are different choices of x. And uh, it's red if uh, solution uh, exists and uh, blue if it doesn't, right? And uh, so this is, uh, of course, uh, if you consider all possible numbers of this form, they will like just, you know, uh, your plane will be just colored completely. But this is a drawing that limits uh, the denominator exponent. So, and this is what we do in the algorithm, right? We, uh, this is the way how we adjust the quality. Uh, we first pick, uh, based on precision we want, we choose uh, maximal uh, denominator exponents that we will use. And once it is chosen, uh, uh, we look on possible entries with uh, this uh, denominator exponent and um, s solve our algorithm. So, and this basically, solving this equation leads uh, to the problem that is called the relative norm equation. Um, um, yeah. Yep. Many yeah. This particular picture has been um, I think four. Um, yeah. And this is just a part of complex plane. You see it's zoomed. <coughs> Why? It's real and imaginary part. A real and imaginary part of what? Uh, of x. Of x. Uh, of x. Yeah. Um, yeah, and uh, just uh, to give a brief feeling, basically how to solve this equation, you actually need uh, one of the sub-problems is the factoring. Uh, and it's known to be a hard problem, but it turns out that uh, actually in this case, it's kind of in that regime, you know, there was a lot of work on factoring, right? And actually here we can harness uh, all this uh, nice uh, number theory results on factoring, on heuristics for factoring. Uh, and actually, uh, you, you need roughly to factor numbers up to 256 bits. And this can be done very easily on uh, modern computers because of that, uh, you know, a lot. Well, so it's actually like on, 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 on a usual computer, right? So. Um, yeah, and... Uh, <clears throat> Uh, so, and how the algorithms works, it actually uh, kind of 
I'm, I phrase the problem of finding this approximation in a slightly different way. I, I, it's a problem with a promise. So I say, okay, I, I promise there is a, exist approximation uh, with some precision, uh, epsilon, and uh, I want to find something better uh, with uh, given complexity. Why it's kind of why it's okay to consider this problem with a promise? Because you know, if you do your search iteratively, right? For example, you find like best circuit for 50 gates. Right? And then you know what's the best circuit for 50 gates and what's the precision it gives. Right? So if you want to find the next one that uses like 51 or 52, you, you, don't, you are not more interested in some qualities that lower that you have already achieved. Right? So this, this is the way how you, where you can take this promise from. Right? And um, this uh, basically limits that kind of possibilities that you need to consider uh, to very small region. Just, uh, Right? And um, uh, it's also the problem is pleased to re like real part and imaginary part. Um, and um, uh, basically you uh, choose a possible approximations for real and imaginary part and then check if there is solution or not. So basically uh, you do this um, uh, <laughs> factoring and uh, check necessary conditions uh, for the existence of solution. Right, and here's just maybe to point out to the other like um, subtlety in this problem, uh, which I call is related to what I call minimal unitaries. So the quality of approximation depends only on the uh, x entry, right? But the t count is actually depends on the whole unitary. And uh, you're interested in what's the so as y is the choice of y is arbitrary, right? So you're actually interested in the uh, what kind of minimal t count you can get for x, and for this you need to consider all solutions to norm equation. So basically, to guarantee the minimality of algorithm, you need to go like uh, through all solutions to this equation uh, and uh, minimize this t count over all solutions. Uh, I'll skip example because I'm a little bit short on time. Uh, so this is uh, just. Um, basically shows the work that was done on this, right? So this is a paper on exact synthesis. Uh, this is a generalization of exact synthesis by uh, Giles and Seligel to multi-qubit case. Uh, so the next work is the uh, first uh, published result which saturated lower bound using a fixed number of ancillas and no resource states. Uh, then it was improved by Selinger's by eliminated ancillas from it, right? And uh, this was in probabilistic polynomial time. Right, and uh, this is an improvement by around uh, thirty percent uh, over this uh, by kind of investing more computational resources, uh, and uh, this is a kind of preliminary work of what I uh, was just talking now because now actually I can prove optimality, which uh, wasn't pos wasn't done in, in this work. Okay, and now I'm moving to <coughs> Fibonacci anions and uh, topological quantum computing. Just to remind actually why it's so exciting uh, uh, to work uh, in topological models. It's kind of, this way you get uh, hardware level fault tolerance. So your computer, you get a gate set that is universal and protected just by design of your physical system. Uh, this is, uh, so you don't need some like extra things like fault tolerant protocols or magic state distillation protocols uh, to achieve universality. And well, there is once you know once there is a hope that you don't need extra things. That the ho there is a hope that you okay you can do more computation, right? Uh, uh, but it turns out that actually like the whole feasibility of this model depends on how well you compile, right? And um, <clears throat> this is why. So this a uh, gate set that you get uh, in this model, right? So it includes um, uh, yeah, <coughs> tenth root of unity and inverse of golden fraction. And what's important, like what's kind of, you know, the way you pay for this universality, right? So you cannot implement exactly even a bit flip. So which is, uh, you know, <coughs> pretty sad. And if you use Solveig type algorithms for that, so it will just eliminate all these advantages. Uh, of uh, using this model without like state distillation or running extra full tolerant protocols. So, and um, here are some, as I told before, also you need the single qubit synthesis method, not just for bit flips, but uh, to actually come up with good multi qubit gates. Right? For example, this are examples for that, uh, uh, of coming, how you can come up with C nodes. And this is, 
you see this is how computation like visualized in this model, right? And uh, this is a precision that you still achieve, can achieve. It's uh, pretty small, and if you go uh, to larger precisions with Solveig et al, you, you won't be able to draw it. Right, and so this is a generic scheme how, uh, in this case, uh, this methods work. And this is a work that I, I done like during my internship in the summer with uh, Alex Bocherov and Krista Swar. Right, and this is high level. You see, uh, it's uh, again we start from unitary, we do a round off to exact unitaries, right, and then apply exact synthesis to get uh, FT circuit. I will explain in a minute what it is. And here is some extra step, which is uh, optimization uh, to actually. Uh, bring it to sigma 1, sigma 2 circuit, which is, uh, so sigma 1, sigma 2 circuit corresponds to actually the things that you're actually doing. The so in Fibonacci model, you're moving particles around, right? And sigma 1 and sigma 2 corresponds to the uh, particle moves, right? While this uh, gate set is just convenient for my theoretical purposes and it's not so directly related to how complex your, you know, computation will be. Um, Okay, uh, so this is uh, definition of this FT gate set. So it somehow looks uh, similar to T gates that we had before, but with 10th root of unity uh, uh, instead of 8th root of unity. And this is uh, F gate, uh, which is, looks the same like as F matrix for Fibonacci model, but it's actually a gate that can be executed using some sequence of sigma 1, sigma 2. You can just search, for it. so this can be found uh, and uh, it's in our paper. Right. Uh, so, and here the story is more interesting about exact synthesis in the sense that how exact, exactly synthesizable unitaries looks like, right? So it actually has some like a, additional things, it's the square root of tau, uh, that, uh, so u, v, and v dagger, u dagger are from, uh, have this form, right? So this is uh, integers uh, extended by 10th root of unity. <laughs> right, and this square root tau, it just kind of, you know, sits around and just uh, plays role when we calculate things, but uh, it's kind of uh, just a um, symbol uh, and uh, all, all kind of variations, that we, all our freedoms are related to uh, this u, v, what's the rings of integers. So this is also like, there's one feature interesting that uh, you have the square root of tau, and the other feature that is interesting that you have actually work with ring of integers instead of uh, ring of integers divided by some square roots to some power, right? So this is, and actually this is changes the structure of exact synthesis proof a lot because you don't have any more this like square roots powers that you, you we, uh, that was used before to kind of understand the circuit complexity. So here we need something different uh, to understand complexity. Uh, ah, okay. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah, sorry. Uh, yeah, I, I, you know, it's a uh, typo. <laughs> right, so yeah, omega here is the ten, 10th root of unity. Yeah, it's, um, so yeah, it could be confusing in this example. Um, <clears throat> uh, so, and, uh, you know, uh, well, actually, you know, the other important objects that we can consider is the real subring uh, is uh, Z tau. And, uh, for example, absolute value squared. You remember, like, in Clifford TV also looked at absolute value squared. And this is belongs to this uh, ring of integers. And the next important object uh, uh, is a Gola automorphism of uh, this ring of integers. And it uh, moves this uh, tau, which is inverse of golden fracture, to minus uh, which is uh, golden uh, golden ratio, right? And uh, so there are different choices actually of complexity measure. Just uh, uh, in our papers there is a different one, but uh, here just kind of to explain it more quickly. Uh, so kind of uh, just you, I think it a busy a, a bit easier to explain with this one. Uh, so this is a Gala conjugation of absolute value squares of the entry. Right, and uh, um, again, some slide to show the intuition behind it. Right, so we uh, look at unitaries of this form, and we rise it to uh, to power n, and see what happens to complexity measure, and we see that it kind of becomes larger and larger. Right, and we are going to use this intuition for exact synthesis. So. Uh, 
uh, here's exact synthesis algorithm. We take as inputs exactly synthesizable unitary, so the unitary of this form, right? And uh, while com value of complexity measures greater than one, we use f multiplied by t uh, to the m to reduce the complexity, right? And uh, basically, we pick uh, m so that complexity measure of the result is minimal possible. And uh, the crucial uh, here is that it can always be done. And in the end, we can achieve mu equals to 1. And once we achieve this, it's just a very simple situation, just some power of root of unity, uh, which we can handle. Right? And so this is uh, small, uh, just very briefly showing the idea of the proof. Uh, right? So this is uh, what you get after you multi so this is the entry after multiplication entry of the unitary after you multiply it by ft to the k right and this is before and we are interested in this ratio how it changes right um, so and basically what's important is that we can always make this ratio uh, roughly less than one third on each step and this means that uh, the number of steps is logarithmic in the uh, value of complexity measure so, Right, and how this is achieved? This is roughly, uh, basically, you can define two vectors, two unit vectors on a complex plane. And by cho choosing k, uh, you adjust the angle between these two vectors. And uh, the rotation, basically, rotations that you have are rotations by uh, five, uh, pi over 5. And by adjusting this rotation, you can kind of move it as orthogonal as possible. And, while, and because of this, you can uh, go be below this number. Okay, yeah, uh, yeah, maybe. Uh, so I mentioned before then uh, complexity is also. So we need to have a good, uh, you know, take of what is complexity, right? How, how we limit the complexity of our unitaries. So in this case, we actually limit uh, complexity by the value of uh, by the logarithm of the complexity measure. So how complex uh, our unitary is pro uh, proportional to the logarithm of complexity measure. It's, it's kind of similar, but uh, to what we have in Clifford and T case, right? In that case, we have the square root in the sum power, right? And the power, which is related to logarithm, uh, power of the square root two was a complexity measure. Uh, okay, and uh, to handle uh, general uh, single qubit uh, synthesis problem, uh, there are two sub problems. Uh, right, first one is uh, RZ rotations, and the second one RZ followed by X. So important case when phi zero is uh, X gate, right? So this includes actually how to synthesize X gate. And uh, uh, there is a lemma in our paper uh, uh, proved by Alex uh, showing that uh, you can Isaac represent unitary and as a uh, product of three RZ rotations, either you have this, uh, the other case. Right, and now I'm going to concentrate on RZ rotations. And in this part, actually, I'm talking about uh, polynomial time algorithm uh, f uh, instead of, uh, uh, as opposed to the last, uh, for Clifford T case, where I was talking about something that is, uh, guarantees optimality. And uh, here is actually a reason for that, because uh, complexity measure in this case is so it allows you to synthesize unitaries, but it doesn't allow you to read off the complexity or just straight, right? So uh, in that case, we just looking by unitary, say, oh, this many this many Hadamard gates is needed, and uh, number of T gates is plus minus one from the number of Hadamard. And in this case, we cannot do these things um, yet. Maybe we'll be able to do them in the future. <clears throat> so and uh, here I'm talking about if. Uh, polynomial time algorithm, um, but constant will be pretty good as, as I'll show later. So this is again the distance that we are aiming for. This is the same distance, right? And it again simplifies to this expression, right? And constraint in this case looks slightly different. And before we had just um, the same thing without tau, and here we got extra tau. And now this uh, just integers, like integers extended by a tenth root of unity, right? And again, we kind of start uh, with actually things uh, that um, gives us required precision. So we identify, so this gray region 
uh, here corresponds to uh, since this helps, gives us precision of approximation epsilon, right? And then we uh, sample uh, u from here. Uh, it's actually simpler to sample from this uh, uh, green region. So we sample u from here such that uh, we have some predefined complexity measure, like bounded complexity measure. And this m here is basically how we bound it. So we compute m, which is around like log uh, tau 1 over epsilon uh, with some uh, constants. And uh, uh, we rescale, also we rescale axes, right? And this rescaling is done actually to improve constant factors. Uh, because uh, once you do round off, uh, you, you actually kind of, th this way you kind of utilize the bits more efficiently. Because uh, you have a choice, you might not rescale this, but then you want to utilize the kind of all your degrees of freedom as efficiently as you could, right? Um, so, for polynomial time, then we actually um, concentrate on a special case of constraints that are easy to handle and easy to solve. This because I mentioned that we have as a sub problem we have a factoring, right? And Everybody knows this is a hard problem, right? So how we come up with polynomial time algorithm when the subproblem is factoring? And it turns out that we can aim for easy cases, right? So I give just one example of easy case. You can, there, you can come up with other examples of easy cases, right? But this is just one uh, with uh, when uh, this right-hand side of the norm equation looks like five to some uh, integer multiplied by prime number of this form, right? And uh, <laughs> this is basically prime number of these forms is a uh, form of prime numbers that must be here is uh, related uh, to number theoretic structure of the problem. It's related to which, uh, prime, uh, which primes are completely split in the 10th uh, degree uh, in the cyclotomic field, 10th uh, degree cyclotomic field. Right, and this condition is uh, also necessary. Uh, it basically says uh, kind of follows directly from uh, positivity of absolute value squared. And the se second one follows from the fact that that uh, automorphism that we were using for Galois, uh, Galois automorphism that we were using for complexity measure, it can be actually defined on, also on the uh, ring of the, for the tenth root of unity, and you can propagate it inside, right? So if you have uh, A plus B tau uh, here, then uh, and it's solvable. The second thing, when we kind of apply this uh, Galois automorphism on top, also must be solvable. Right, so we, and it turns out there is a simple, L, oh well, not simple, but uh, efficient um, algorithm for solving norm equation in this case. Right, and um, this is an example of how the sampling is go going, right? Because, well, that, that picture is kind of a little bit not realistic, it's not how it happens because epsilon is so small. When, kind of, for interesting cases, so it's kind of more closer to reality, right? And uh, basically divides that gray, uh, green region uh, into these um, cells, right? And uh, number of cells um, uh, scales like one over epsilon, right? So basically um, smaller, um, yeah, smaller epsilon we get, uh, more cells we get. Uh, and uh, we randomly sample from them, and sometimes uh, we get non-solvable cases, uh, and sometimes we get solvable but not easily solvable, and uh, sometimes we get solvable cases. And so this uh, was actually, uh, this is somehow analogous to prime number theorem, right? And uh, in prime number theorem it says that if you sample from uh, numbers from zero to m, uh, you will, uh, the density of primes will, will be m over log m. So basically, number of efforts uh, because, uh, you need to do before you successfully find a prime in this random process is uh, log, uh, log m. So th that's why, the, and similar thing happens here, it basically actually some kind of uh, conjecture because uh, that this happens here, it's, uh, uh, that we rely on our proof. Uh, and uh, this means that we can efficiently find easy, so we can find easy case in like with, with logarithmic number of efforts. That guarantees efficiency of algorithm. The other thing that guarantees efficiency of the algorithm is that actually it's 
primes can be recognized in like polynomial time. So there is a famous result, uh, the reason that, uh, you know, there is like deterministic algorithm for uh, ch checking if the prime is not uh, or, or it is, right? Uh, or, and or some other results like primality test, like miller rabin primality test uh, that we use here. Positive, right? Yeah, it's, it's small, but it's yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But I think so. The deterministic one does it still have a false positive? No, that so this, that was like uh, very. You know, I mean, this is, I think within last decade, right? This was breakthrough, so uh, nailing down the problem of uh, prime testing, right? That you can in polynomial time decide uh, the, if the number is prime or not without any false positive. It's like AKS uh, algorithm. What? Well, for Miller Rabin, you just test 100 times and then you calculate It's still faster in practice. Yeah, I mean, so Miller Rabin is better for practice, yes, because that one is, has pretty bad uh, constants uh, and, uh, and pretty bad, actually, powers in the logarithm. So, yeah, that's uh, OK. Yeah, and uh, yeah, this is uh, just one other small detail, how the, uh, basically, how you pick uh, points inside the cells, right? To actually pick the point, uh, we use uh, continued fractions, right? So we, um, first we uh, select the take a center of the cell, uh, and then we find uh, uh, imaginary coordinate just by finding the best possible approximation with a continued fraction. Right, and then we do the same thing for x coordinate, right? And uh, so this is kind of technically how how the results looks like. <coughs> uh, so this is what you can achieve. Uh, so basically, with roughly like tau to the n, right? Uh, precision uh, by allowing uh, b to be less than phi to the n. Right? And, and, and here you can see actually. Uh, where is it bit balancing uh, thing uh, comes from, right? Because uh, if you don't rescale uh, the whole thing, right, then uh, basically uh, x will be around 1, right, and uh, uh, b will be fixed, and a will be kind of too, for a, the too small degree of freedom, right? So by rescaling, actually, we kind of take into account the degrees of freedom for a that we have. Well, this is very high level, so uh, if it's <coughs> confusing, uh, don't worry. Um, <coughs> uh, okay, so and these are experimental results of how this uh, algorithm for Fibonacci anions works, right? So it, it was implemented in C++ uh, using uh, Pari GPS subroutine to solve norm equation, uh, and uh, this is a comparison to brute force search. So this is actually more like uh, about you know how good. Con so I've been talking you know about that algorithm efficient and it, uh, it efficient in asymptotic sense, right? But okay, what's the constant factors? Uh, yeah, and this shows what's the constant factors. So uh, this is um, what our algorithm does, and this is what uh, results of brute force, right? So you see that it's uh, uh, around uh, basically like twenty percent overhead in comparison to brute force, which is uh, I think very good for uh, polynomial time algorithm. Right, and uh, so this is the case of RZ rotations, and for uh, RZX uh, is a slightly larger overhead. Okay, this is um, uh, this shows how it scales, right? And uh, this are, there are different parts, right? So synthesis part, this is exact synthesis algorithm, norm equations. This is uh, part. This is inside Pari GP. Uh, just you know, because uh, it's it's not very well documented, so we actually needed to check if it actually really does uh, solve things in polynomial time. Uh, and uh, this is uh, as a part of approximation algorithm, right? And uh, the last thing is there is synthesis, uh, so I didn't talk before much about it, <laughs> right? So this is uh, the thing. Uh, this is how you translate your FT uh, circuit into sigma 1, sigma 2 circuit, which is needed uh, to, kind of, to really execute the things on the hardware. And uh, here I use uh, peep hole optimization. So I made a database of optimal sigma 1, sigma 2 circuit up to some size, 
right? And uh, then I take a circuit, FT circuit, uh, rewrite it using simple, so you can express F gate using sigma one, sigma two, and you can express that my T gate, well, for this, T gate for this model, right? Uh, precisely using small number of generators, you get the sequence and then you optimize it. Uh, using peep hole optimization, so you uh, take sub circuit and uh, find the unit in the database, replace with the optimal one, and do it until uh, it's possible to do. And uh, I would I would say it's like around twice, uh, something like that. Uh, I think maybe, yeah, I think my uh, okay. it was around twice. I uh, yeah probably should kind of do this experiment uh, to show. Um, um, how how it you know some because I just did some exp you know on the way of my development uh, looked at this yeah and uh, yeah and it, it's important to know that this scaling is actually uh, in all these algorithms this is uh, kind of typical to present scaling as a number of arithmetic operation as opposed to the number of bit size in the bit size right so this is a scaling as the number of arithmetic operation. Uh, because I'm using fixed uh, bit size uh, types. So I use large ones, uh, but it's a fixed size. So there are, for example, 512 uh, bits uh, integers, 1024 bits integers, and 2048 size integers. And this, is, this shows uh, scaling uh, of uh, algorithm runtime depending on the choice of how many bits you use. Right? And, uh, the last point I think to make about this that you see the scaling is like all below like two, right? And for Solvaki type it's like two seventy something, right? So I mean this algorithm not just uh, gives much better results, it's called Solvaki type, it's actually runtime scales better. Uh, so it, you know it's uh, basically wins on the all kind of on in the all directions. Right? Yeah, and this is just uh, uh, as a part of the conclusion, just want to highlight uh, a few other uh, things that I've done on uh, uh, related to compiling. So uh, this uh, work is uh, called like synthesis of unitaries with Clifford and T circuits. It's an uh, improvement of exact synthesis algorithm for multi-qubit unitaries, in, uh, for multi-qubit Clifford and T unitaries. So the results that I, was, I mentioned before by Stellinger, it uh, had actually, uh, with a number of qubits, the circuit size scaled doubly exponentially. Right, and uh, here it just scales exponentially, and uh, well, and of course you can come up with qubits, uh, with circuits that actually has exponential number of gates, uh, with a number of qubits. So uh, it's kind of, you know, basically you cannot, I think, cannot do much better uh, in a symptotic sense for generic situation, right? Because sure you can do for for special cases you can do better than exponent and. Uh, but this kind of small small papers that close this kind of theoretical question about exact synthesis, right? So in this paper, it's um, algorithm for t count. This is more you know like kind of practical paper like uh, about uh, for maybe two and three qubits uh, for Clifford t. Um, can you actually how how you improve your exha exhaustive search? And what was done here, basically kind of split Clifford group uh, from T count. And we come up with, this uh, with a canonical form that kind of removes this, uh, you know, make it invariant with respect to Clifford group. And uh, uh, this allows you kind of to, in, you, once you're using some like exhaustive methods, this allows you significantly uh, compress search space. And uh, as a consequence, uh, we were able, for example, to prove that uh, if you're not using measurements and ancillas, you need uh, 70 gates to make a Toffoli gate. So this was the paper that first rigorously proved uh, this result. Of course, uh, there, I mean, this is, you know, it's kind of a little bit, uh, this particular result is, you know, I mean, it's a little bit of theoretical interest more than like practical because uh, there is no like circuits that use measurement and uh, classical feedbacks that can do TOEFL like in f uh, f with 40 gates. But uh, still, you know, the technique uh, and ideas I think uh, will be useful uh, for optimization of circuits. Because um, uh, in peep hole optimization, for example, if you, the larger data database you get, uh, the better results you have. 
right? So it's uh, actually uh, I did this kind of experiment for this paper, and uh, I've seen like a uh, serious difference between, for example, when I'm using three qubit database to optimize Clifford uh, circuits and when I'm using four qubit database. Right? Uh, and also, this paper kind of nicely matches this one because you now kind of we remove this problem from here, right? And it started separately in this paper. So uh, how how you can actually optimize Clifford circuits? And for small number of qubits, uh, there is a way uh, using binary symplectic representation. Uh, you can build uh, pretty large databases up to like handling like up to four qubits. And uh, also, we look to what happens when you use them for people optimization of larger things. And the last one is, you know, I think, uh, um, paper with Nathan Weeb. Right? Uh, uh, well, it's, it's, it's right say to say it's a paper by Nathan Weeb and me uh, that kind of asking the question about uh, a single qubit synthesis in a slightly different way, uh, which is very neat because. Uh, in many cases, you're not really, so all the way around here, I, I was asking about absolute precision, right? And sometimes you, absolute precision is not the uh, probably thing that, uh, I mean, it, it's, it can be high, right? In many cases, you can, especially like in simulation, chemistry simulation, you might want to rotate by very small angle, but your like relative precision is small, but uh, absolute precision is still big. So in this paper, it actually addresses how to benefit in this, uh, from this situation. So what you can actually do, you can do measurements and classical feedback, kind of split your uh, rotation in two parts, like mantissa and exponent, and uh, do exponent part with some tree structure. And uh, uh, because of this, uh, basically you can beat that log one over, like bit lower bounds up to constant factor. Right? Because you can come up with uh, uh, numeric lower bounds, how good you can do in uh, Clifford and T case, right? Uh, and you can actually beat it uh, by kind of stating problem differently uh, uh, in this paper. Um, okay, and uh, here's my uh, conclusion. So. Uh, basically, today I discussed uh, how ideas from computational number theory can be applied to circuit synthesis of single qubit union trees. Uh, right? So I showed uh, efficient asymptotic, uh, asymptotically optimal algorithm for uh, compiling to Fibonacci anions braid patterns, and I showed, uh, you know, sketched uh, how you can get optimal ancilla-free Clifford plus T circuits uh, solving the same problem. All above is uh, implemented in C++, so it's not, you know, it's just not, theoretical work is actually, you know, practical, it works, and this, uh, for Clifford NT is uh, it's an open source project. Um, so this was, uh, I, I am developing here, it, uh, I was developing in the summer, and uh, also continue contributing, right, and uh, like I want to finish actually with the question, what is next, right? And uh, I think the next kind of questions that are interesting to look at is include measurements in these number theoretic frameworks. Uh, this is one interesting direction. Uh, the other interesting direction actually kind of uses methods to come up with good multi-qubit uh, Fibonacci circuits. And also, I still I still think that something interesting can be done for multi-qubits Clifford and T circuits once you use, for example, two or three qubits. Uh, and uh, that paper by uh, David Gossett and me and others, I think it's kind of starting point, can be a starting point. Uh, and uh, last question is, uh, was the generic mathematical structure behind exact synthesis? Because answering it is also important because I think uh, once you include these measurements, right, you can get access to some other number fields. And uh, uh, Alex asked me this question like a long time ago, how you combine things, right? How you combine, for example, result from their work, which is um, uh, V-basis, uh, right? Uh, this, for example, Clifford and T. Actually, I, I should mention that V-basis is a precisely the, the thing that was uh, in Sarnak paper when they prove existential result, and then Alex and uh, Krista and Yuri uh, showed uh, that you know there is a constructive way actually for that gate set. All right, so it's also kind of interesting. Yeah. So thanks. Um, 
Uh, thanks everybody for attention. Uh, that's it. Yeah, I'm, I'm curious. Uh, with your work with Dimitri involving uh, Clifford synthesis, yeah. um, have you noticed any um, side effects that are uh, any improvements that might be relevant for, say, randomized benchmarking or other uh, applications? Well, I think uh, so. Is that you know, uh, yeah, I, I did. You know, I, I kind of didn't mention this here. Yeah, we, we, as one of our application, we mentioned. Uh, Randomized benchmarking, right? Which is so randomized benchmarking is a uh, way how you kind of check the quality. Of, it's a modern way of checking uh, quality of your quantum computer, right? Before there was like this tomography, right? But it's uh, difficult to do and not efficient. And randomized benchmarking protocol allows, allows you kind of to extract some rough uh, quality information, rough information about the quality of uh, how your com computer works. And uh, basically, this. Um, one of other applications for this uh, work of Clifford optimization actually performs this benchmarking protocols better. So you can uh, basically have a shorter sequences uh, to perform these experiments faster. And you know, uh, for example, if you compare it to what you get uh, using uh, some, there is like algorithms for decomposing uh, Clifford unitaries into circuits by uh, this kind of canonical that works in polynomial time, but it gives you some long circuit. And uh, our circuit is probably like around, uh, for small number of qubits can be like uh, maybe two, three, four times shorter. So this just gives you, you know, like reduces your waiting time in physics experiment. And um, uh, I think that's an maybe interesting thing about uh, relating uh, this to this benchmarking applications that uh, it's kind of puts together uh, uh, implementation at peep hole optimization. So first you use opti your circuits to benchmark things, right? And then you, once you get your Clifford circuits, you replace precisely, you optimize it pre using the same database. So this ensures that your circuit in your algorithm is, has the same circuits that you use for benchmarking. So um, I think, yeah. Um, and yeah, I think in, in that direction, there is also some freedom to explore because uh, you know, there are trade-offs you can play depending on uh, what gates uh, in your physical system are more difficult to do and easier to do. Because in that paper, we just looked at some basic cases. And there are like ways uh, how you can uh, maybe do it a little bit further, uh, this uh, brute force part, uh, depending on your architecture. Yeah, thanks. Question. Um, for this FT basis, mm -hmm. so you had certain things like since you had 10th root of unity, I guess um, the 10th the, the power of one of these gates is equal to the identity. Yes. I guess this F gate squared perhaps is yes. the identity. Are there any other non trivial relations or is it a free um, other than that? So uh, we've been looking at, uh, you know, so this is, you know, not published. And so we've, we've been looking at uh, canonical form for the circuits, right? And um, basically, uh, there are, so the uh, untrivial relation is like, the other uh, non-trivial relation is like, um, uh, includes like search powers of uh, T and uh, it's like F, T cube, F, T cube, F, T cube, I think equals to identity if I'm not mistaken, right? And there's actually, we come up with a canonical form uh, for that, I, I'm pretty sure that it's kind of how it must be, but uh, I don't have a, a proof uh, of it. So you basically uh, cannot have uh, third and seven powers. So you, you can have a canonical form like FT, FT, right? And you cannot have third powers of T uh, and seventh power, and you cannot have a bit strings like uh, ones and uh, a bunch of fours and one. So because that's, that's because of that identity, actually. Because um, because of that identity, you can kind of a little bit exchange it once and force and move them together and uh, bring it to three, which becomes an optimal. Uh, yeah. yeah. So, so there is a young Baxter, of course, right? Um, so, so, so it's a it's a neat group theoretical problem. It's, it, the group is clearly finitely representable. Mm -hmm. But what is the finite uh, representation in terms of uh, generators, which are the two generators? Uh, what are the, the minimum set of relations? It's not known. 
but those those three continue. No, I I, I mean so. Uh, so my point is that um, that uh, the last one, that ft cube, I, the last, uh, it's not untrivial. Uh, the, the only non-trivial one. Yeah. So because um, I, what I actually I did like, I got this canonical form. I, I kind of so you can uh, solve recurrent system of recurrence relations to get how many optimal circuits you need, you have with specific number of these uh, f gates, right? And uh, I did computer search and I compare the numbers and they're the same. That's the only non trivial one, or it's, it's not simple? Actually, FTQ cubed, right? Yes, yeah, so that's what you said. It's, a, it's a, the, well, the consequence of the other box. It's, it's not something. Yeah, I'm, I'm just yeah. asking, are there, is it a theorem that there are no other non trivial relations? Well, it's, it's, not proved yeah. yet. it's not proved. <laughs> but I think it's, you know, I can believe it. I, I believe it, but, uh, but it, it's not yet proved yet. Have you thought about other, so in the beginning you showed you know, these non-constructive yeah. uh, papers and they talk about other bases, you know, these algebraic entries for SU2 and yeah. SUD. Have you thought about other bases that might be of interest to look at? Here? Yeah, I think. Because, um, you know, now we, well, we have three. Yeah, I think, uh, so uh, I, I, didn't, I didn't think like of any specific ones, but I kind of thought about the sources like where they can come from, right? And uh, so they can come from actually, for Fibonacci, they can come from including measurements in the model, right? So because uh, each time you include measurement, you will normalize, right? So there might be some other variations of uh, like, you know, in Fibonacci case and the same thing like, uh, so uh, so in your paper in Alex, it's like, v so V basis is one example, right? And you have like other, uh, possible denominators, right? And uh, so this also comes from, you know, can uh, I think basically the way to get this other basis is, is do some of these um, measurements uh, and, and see uh, what you get in the, uh, once you apply measurements. You know, the we, we have, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so this is. Uh, um, I've been sort of musing for quite a while, as some of you know in the audience, about quantum Fourier transform in radix other than two, or a power of two. Um, it's pretty easy to generate rotations of pi over 10, or pi over five, or something like that, with this sort of idea. What what is left then, at least, is generating a state which superposes equal amplitudes by 0, 1, 2, 3, and 4, uh, sorry, 0, 1, 2, 3, and 4 by 5. If you could superpose those and then use those to control application of the rotations, you would have a radix 5 to the k Fourier transform. So how could we do that? How could we generate a state that has equal distributions of amplitude across across mm -hmm. that space. Uh, yeah, I think so. I think. Um, yeah. Um, uh, well, I mean, first, first, you can uh, we can answer like the questions. It can it cannot be done exactly right because uh, one over square root of five is uh, you not can't generate rotations of t t you know. Yeah, and, and then the uh, then I think so. There are actually there. Are, uh, there is a literature on uh, state preparation, uh, like decomposing, for example, like how you do state preparation using single qubit and C naught, and slightly, slightly different methods than, uh, for example, how you do unitaries with, with single qubit and C naught. Uh, then uh, there is like, you know, uh, that, for example, uh, in this paper, right, the, the, this the main building block actually is the state preparation, right? So th this is, this uh, works. B so basically, uh, it, sometimes it's actually common to answer the question how to exactly prepare states with a certain model, right? And uh, after that, um, so I think so. This is kind of included in what, what next, right? So like. Um, um, but but a multi qubit uh, for Fibonacci, uh, right? So actually, how how, how you exactly what are exactly synthesizable states with Fibonacci model, and then you can just like round off the whole state, 
right? And it, it's actually, uh, no, state round off is easier problem than unity round off because you just, uh, for example, for, for even though you have like multi qubit state, right? You just have one constraint, it must be normalized to one, right? So that's, uh, and that's basically uh, leads to one norm equation that we already kind of well, it's already well studied by us for, for this yeah, case. On the other hand, in, 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 in Adix 5, there are five unknowns, I suppose. Uh, no, so I mean, in this case, you just oh, you just take entries and round off each of them, and you yeah. you give yourself some small freedom in yeah. the end, which is uh, could be one small entry, right? That defines basically the how how good you approximate and um, and actually for Redix, uh, well, I mean for ten cyclotomic uh, field, uh, it's not actually. So we use like fifth root of unity, right? So it's like uh, tens, uh, tens uh, cyclotomic field, but it's, a, it's actually like fourth degree extension, right? So an integral basis uh, that I'm using here, right? You can see it's um, get here. Where is my integral? Yeah. So it's just four numbers, right? So basically, in terms of integers, it's just four degree of freedom. It's actually other things that kind of need that uh, in Clifford T and in Fibonacci it was like fourth degree extension and there are only like four, uh, there are only two different uh, fourth degree groups, right? And actually they're, they're like, this is a cyclic fourth degree group, right? So it's like uh, in Fibonacci case, it's um, uh, Z4. And uh, in uh, Clifford, and like, okay, sorry, I jumped. Uh, so you can look at the Galois group of this extension, right? And uh, Galois group of uh, this extension is uh, Z4, and for Clifford and T, it's Klein group. Yeah. So maybe? Yeah, I think it's uh, considerable in, in the future, right? I have a question about the round off procedure. Yeah. So you explained you do it in two step fashion. First, you round off, then you do the exact synthesis. Yes. Um, but somehow it seems that the round of algorithm itself, there's a, there's a kind of a trade space. It could be very efficient, but then maybe the, the, the precision is not so high. Or uh, you, you seem to su suggest a norm equation solver to do the round off. Mm -hmm. um, I wonder how that compares to like methods that Salinger proposed. He proposed a very efficient method. No, it's also round. norm equation. Just and special. So uh, what Salinger does is just uh, solves a uh, special case of norm equation, right? right, right. So this is. Uh, I mean, this is kind of. Uh, well, not quite, right? He, he has a, a polynomial. Ah, you mean you mean the algorithm. second, second? You mean like so? Okay, if we are talking about Salinger paper now, right? So there are two steps. Still two steps. The first step is round off, and right. the second one is uh, uh, to solve, no, check if this instance of the norm, like I mean, in that paper there is no like word norm equation, right? And uh, the first time when it's appeared, uh, like it's, it's related to norm equation, is that this like the practical approximation paper? In that paper, there is um, uh, no this word. And but you know, if if you're talking about in this language, right? So then, uh, first step you do round off, and the second step uh, you solve norm equation and basically check if it's an easy instance of the norm equation and solve it. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, check. And actually, I mean, you can, you know, I, I, I said before that I, I here I present a very kind of simple case of what is an easy instance, right? But you can say, okay, I have, for example, this, I can have an easy instance of the other type. I, have, I can have a smooth number, right, with just one big uh, prime factor, right? And this is also an easy instance for factoring problem. And it will handle like more situations than just hoping for having one prime number. Right, and going back to this round off, right, it's um, actually, so this is an interesting difference between the Clifford and T case and, for example, Fibonacci case, that... Um, uh, where there is, uh, there is this greater than zero, the two greater than zero conditions. Yes. So it's, um, um, way back. There's no Oh, okay. oh, this one. Yeah. So, so here, right here, I get them from round. So they actually, I don't need to do any work to satisfy both of them, because uh, uh, first one satisfied just by choice a number of this uh, that it's inside here, and the second one is that I can prove that it will be also satisfied, right? So, 
And in Clifford and Tick uh, case, it's actually non-automatically satisfied, right? And you need to do extra work. And if you remember, there's like, in Salinger paper, he has this like volume, right? He has the small cells and they, there is a, uh, uh, bound of, on the volume, it's actually, I think, interesting. It might be related to uh, the famous Minkowski theorem on uh, uh, about, you know, convex bodies and uh, lattice. So if uh, there is a, like, if you uh, have convex body with, deter with uh, volume greater than uh, determinant of the lattice, then you can find a point inside it. So, and actually it's, uh, I mean, to me it looks pretty similar. Uh, to what he is doing to the constructive proof of the Minkowski theorem, but I mean, it's, it's kind of tweaked a little bit. And I, I've been looking recently on some literature, and it might be actually, uh, you know, yeah, related. You are absolutely right. But uh, the bottom line is that in, in HD case, it's, it's very hard work to actually get a green point right. in, in a convex uh, domain of interest. So that's here, here it's almost trivial. Yeah, here, 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 here is, you don't have to care about the extra condition. And the same is in the case in the V basis case. Uh, yeah. Uh, well, well I, I, basis, probably it's, it's even simpler. I mean, the V basis is trivial squared. Kind of thing. Wait, wait. Mathematically, or he's making a joke. I don't. I'm just giving him a hard. Let's thank Vinny again. Okay.